Well, good morning and welcome to Bay Life Church. We are so glad that you're here. If I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Brian and I'm the lead pastor here. Uh, we're just having a great time in the Christmas season. This is uh, what uh, we, uh, a series that we have called Wonderful Life. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an opportunity for us to come together as the body of Christ and remember what it was that Jesus did for us. Um, I, I want to pray, but before I do that, uh, I just want to add a word to what it is that uh, Pastor Mike said earlier when he was speaking to you at the beginning of the service. Uh, our Bright Lights campaign allows us to share wonderful life with all those in our community, and to have impact with the gospel around the world. Uh, this has been kind of a growing uh, initiative for us over these uh, last two years. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for being a radically generous church. Uh, the most generous church by far that I've had the opportunity to serve. And I just want to encourage you in the, 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 the great gift of giving to others. Um, we've got two weeks, and in that two weeks, we would like to complete our offering. Keep in mind, you can give all the way up to the end of the year, and you can do it online. You can mail a check. You can drop it off here at Christmas Eve. Uh, but uh, by doing this, we get the opportunity to change lives uh, right here in our church family, in our community, and around the world. Um, so much of what we get to do during the year is because of what happens here at Christmas time. Thank you, thank you again for your generosity. Can we pray? And then we'll dive into God's word. Father, we just ask uh, that you would meet us here. And Father, that uh, as uh, our, our minds are busy with our Christmas to-do list, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, still our hearts and our minds just for these few moments that we spend together. Lord, I pray that uh, it would be a time where our hearts are open to the message of the gospel. Lord, I want to pray specifically for those who came on the invitation of a friend who came just because it's Christmas or they saw something on social media or got uh, an invitation handed to them. And uh, Lord, I, I just pray that uh, as the gospel message goes out right now, uh, that those hearts would be especially open. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, hey, welcome to week three of Wonderful Life. And just by way of review, let's uh, throw up here the definition of what we are calling a wonderful life. A wonderful life is a life that is free from personal baggage and filled with eternal meaning. I don't know about you, but uh, at Christmas time especially, I want to be done with the baggage of the past. I don't want that coming back. And, and all of that stuff that may be happening because of transitions or tragedies in our lives, even right now, that we could release that and that we could experience a wonderful life, a life free from personal baggage and filled with eternal potential. I want to talk to us and focus our attention this morning on the least familiar thing that Jesus said in his most familiar saying. Let me say that again, right, in case you're just waking up. I, I, I want to talk to you about the least familiar thing that Jesus said in the midst of saying his most familiar saying, right? Right? So what is one of the most familiar sayings that Jesus ever uttered? It was when he made claims about himself. He made a triad of claims, three claims in particular. He said, I am the way. Now, whether you saw it on the screen or just could recite it by memory, your mind raced to the rest of the story, right? The rest of that verse while I'm pausing on the first part where Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. Um, what's the way for? Right? Uh, where does it begin? Where does it end? Why do we need 
Jesus to be the way. Let me ask you this. Have you ever lost your way? Hands of those of you who ever have lost your way, right? So I'm going to tell you a Christmas story about the Piffing family losing their way. It was when our kids were small, and uh, we had an old Toyota van, and uh, they were all packed in the van, and we were going from one end of Florida to the other end of the state for Christmas time, and we were all very eager to get there. And so when you're coming from Miami to North Florida, you, uh, you drive north on the same highway for a very long time. You take I-75 all the way up, and then you hit Lake City, and you turn left. And that's the whole trip, right? Uh, and that takes you all the way out into the panhandle, and you're on I-10. And uh, so I, we, we always leave very early so the kids will sleep for at least part of the trip, right? Uh, that is the secret to parenting and long-term marriage, okay? And uh, so I had taken the first shift, and I had driven from way early in the morning, and we had just... Uh, made it around the corner, and literally, we were like two hours from home. I'm super excited. I pull off, fill the car up with gas. My lovely bride had been sleeping uh, for a while. We'll just say she normally falls asleep when we leave the driveway and wakes up when we enter the driveway on the other end. But uh, that's because she's raised seven kids, and so she's due uh, for a nap. But uh, anyway, she'd been sleeping for a while, and it's like, man, I, I, if I'm going to be civil when I get there, I need a little bit of a nap, so I need to rest. So I filled up the car, handed her the keys. Why don't you get us the last two hours home? And I jumped in and went promptly to sleep. Well, what I didn't know is these are before the days of GPS. Just got to... I'll, I'll give that to my wife. It was before the days of GPS, and it was kind of a convoluted exit, so she gets out to the exit, and guess what? She turns east instead of west, but she had no idea. There's no one in her phone saying, recalculating. <laughs> and she was just glad the kids were asleep and that I was asleep, and she just took off. And I had a wonderful nap. And when I woke up, I needed another nap. When I saw the signs to Lake City, five miles. And I'm like, I could have sworn we were like 100 miles from Lake City when I went to sleep. How are we this close to Lake City? And sure enough, we figured out she had just turned the wrong way. And in fairness, we had not lost our way. We knew exactly where we were, which was the problem. <laughs> and now instead of two more hours, we now had four more hours to get to our destination. Losing your way has consequences. Losing your way is unpleasant. Losing your way, way makes you a bit uncivil with the people you would normally love and care for. I only told that story because I know my wife is in the other buildings. <laughs> There's, I'm sure, another side to the story that I've never allowed to be told. But, um, you know, it's losing your way is no fun. So when Jesus came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We all understand what it means when he says he's the truth and that he's life, that he's wonderful life, that he's abundant life, that he's eternal life. We, we get that part, but, but what about this thing that he is the way? Well, you know, it was in the earliest days of the church in the book of Acts that the church was referred to by this name. They were called followers of what? The way. They were followers of the way. It must have been a much more common name for Christ and his mission in those days than it is today, but it was so common that that's what his followers referred to as. They were followers of the way. When the Apostle Paul spoke of the church the first time, right after he was miraculously saved and he's looking back on his past life, and what did he say of himself and the church? He said, I persecuted the followers of the way. This was the name of the church. They knew what it meant. 
So let me ask you, what does it mean that Jesus is the way? Well, the, the word simply means road or path or journey. Jesus, obviously, as we see it in context throughout the scripture, Jesus, obviously, is talking about the way back to God. The way to have a spiritual and emotional and relational experience with God the Father. And Jesus said, I am the way. Well, if he's the way back, and he came here to declare that he was the way back to the Father, how had they lost their way? How had they lost their way? Well, that's a longer story. In fact, it's three stories. And so I, I, we're going to kind of go to Sunday school this morning. And, and those of you that grew up around church, you'll know all three of these stories very well. And even if you didn't grow up in church, you'll probably know these same three stories. In order to find out about how it was that mankind lost his way, we have to go all the way back to the beginning, right? Because it seems man is so talented at losing our way, they lost their way like immediately. We have to go back to the story of the first man and the first woman, right? Adam and Eve. And here's the first principle that I want to share is that Adam and Eve were symbols of the fact that mankind had lost their proximity to the way. They lost their access point to the way. How did that happen? Well, you, if you're familiar with the story, you know they're in a place called the Garden of Eden. And there are many trees and fruit-bearing trees and bushes and flowers and all kinds of vegetation there. But there were two trees pointed out by God the Father when he said, these two trees, you need to stay away from these two trees. One was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and one was the tree of life, right? And so what did they do? They didn't do what they were supposed to do. They lost their way like immediately and because they're tempted and enticed by the evil one to eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil because he said, you'll be like God. You'll understand right and wrong. Well, they were going to understand that and a whole lot more, right? And so they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in so doing, they violated the command of God. They lost their way morally. Now they're still in the garden. And they have this encounter with God in the cool of the evening. And he's like, where are you? And well, we're hiding. And why are you hiding? Well, because we're naked. Well, who told you you were naked? Well, well, we may have eaten from that tree. And, and then suddenly we knew. Yeah. And they were broken. Morally broken. Now, God removed them from the garden. Why did he do that? Lest... They eat of the other tree, the tree of life. And they would have been eternally confirmed in their state of moral sin and brokenness. And so God, in, in a measure of grace, removed them geographically from proximity to the access point to the way. I want you to read a verse that we don't often read in the early Garden of Eden account, it's verse 24 in chapter 3. It says, he, that is God, drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim. That's a, a rank of angels, right? And a flaming sword that turned every way. The sword pointed in every direction. Why? To guard what? The way to the tree of life. Adam and Eve lost their proximity. And that single fatal choice just didn't just affect them. It didn't just affect their kids, Cain and Abel, and all those that would be born from them. No, it affected you and me. It affected the entire human race. The apostle Paul described it this way when he was talking about what hap happened with Adam and Eve and what happened to us today. In Romans 5:12, it says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that was Adam, and death through sin. And so this is what happened. This was the impact of a single fatal choice. Death spread to all men because all have sinned. 
You know, one of the greatest things about Christmas at our house this year is we're expecting a grandchild. That's not new, but this one is special because every new one is special in some special way. And um, Shiloh and Andy made the announcement, and it's Facebook official, so I can say it from the stage, basically what that means. And uh, so they're expecting number 11 for us, number one for them, right? And we are so excited. And after Christmas, we're getting the whole gender reveal thing. I used to hate those, but now there's my grandkids. I love them. Don't invite me to your grandkids' gender reveal. That's not a thing for me. But for my kids, it's awesome. And uh, we're kind of all cheering for a girl because we've got to balance the score a little bit. Got the whole football team. Now it's time for some girls. Uh, and, um, and as precious as that child is, and in our mind, as perfect as they will be, they have lost their way before they ever get here. They are under the Adamic curse because they are not only Andy and Shiloh's child, they're, they're Adam's child. And so they bear the consequences of his single fatal choice. The break in fellowship, the break in proximity is real, it's tangible, it's geographic. We lost our way. But even in the midst of that crisis, there is a promise that the way will come again. Genesis 3.15, let me read this to you. God says, I will make you, he's talking to the snake here, he's talking to the Satan, to the evil one. I will make you enemies of each other, you and the woman. Your offspring and her offspring it will crush your head and you will strike its heel. I remember having to memorize that as a kid. It's like, what are they talking about? Heads and heels and snakes and women and what is all that about? He's essentially saying this, right? Check this out. A way maker has been prophesied. There is someone coming. That Genesis 3.15 is what theologians they have. Theologians have weird words for stuff. So the word for Genesis 3.15 is the proto-evangelion. Now, we don't talk that way in Alabama. What is proto-evangelion? It's the first occurrence of the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus coming, right? To be the way. The, the, the proto-evangelion right here next to the fall. When man lost their way, Guess what? God says the way is coming again. There's one who will make a way for you. We're going to prohibit you. We're gonna, you're going to lose your proximity to the way to the tree of life. But, but there's one coming who is the way and the truth and the life. And he's saying the seed of the woman is going to come. And Satan would bruise his heel. He would give him a temporary wound. He would put him on a cross. He would take his life. But then Jesus would take his life back. He would rise from the grave on the third day, and he would declare that he was victorious over sin and Satan and hell and the grave. And that would be when he would crush the head of Satan. Right? That Satan would bruise the heel of Christ, but Christ would crush the head of of Satan. That is what it looks like when the gospel comes, when the way would be reopened. Think about prophecies as many times they're talking about an event far in the future, and that was the case here. But a way maker had been prophesied. You would think because of the cost of having to leave the garden that mankind would get their act together, that we would shape ourselves up, that we would try to get back to the way. That's not what happened. Moral drift turned into moral collapse. Right? Total moral collapse. And this brings us to the second Sunday school story. Right? It's about Noah, the guy that built the ark. Right? Noah becomes the symbol that mankind has lost their desire for the way. Right under Adam, they lost, their pro they lost their access to the way. Now, they don't even want the way. 
By the time we get to Noah, they have lost their desire for the way. Let me read, would you skip ahead three chapters? Genesis chapter 6, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man out of the earth, and it, it grieved him to his heart. God is heartbroken. It goes on, so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Most tragic statement in all of Scripture. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And here we see grace at the end of judgment, right? Mankind has lost their way. Their moral compass has collapsed, and they are going to pay the ultimate price. They will be blotted out by a worldwide flood. And in the midst of that, God would remind them of the way. God would remind them, I haven't forgotten. I am judging almost completely mankind because of their moral drift. But I have not forgotten my promise to provide a way. So Noah would become the first reset button. Just as God had started the human race with Adam and Eve, one family, now he would restart the human race with one family, Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. And he would put them on an ark. The ark itself would become a symbol of salvation out of judgment. Here is the promise given to Noah. This is what we call the Noahic covenant. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and multiply and increase in number and fill the earth. This was the same command given to Adam. This was God hitting the reset button. And yet, in the midst of this, a covenant of grace is made, right? In fact, we still get to see it. We see it often here because Mobile is the rainiest place on the planet. And so what happens after the rain? So often, and it just seems to happen up by my house so frequently, this last rainy season, I think four weeks in a row, I didn't see one. I saw a double rainbow. It's just like God saying, welcome to paradise after 20 years in Chicago. <laughs> You're home, right? You know what that rainbow is? That rainbow is the ongoing covenant of God's grace that he would never again destroy the population of the earth with water. So every time we think we're drowning in Mobile and the Eastern Shore, God sends the rainbow to remind us, not yet. The rainbow is our reminder that the way was not only promise, uh, prophesied, but catch this, the way was possible. The way back was possible. God had not only prophesied the coming of the way, but he says now it's going to happen. He gave the, the promise, the covenant, a second time. So you would think you've restarted. The human race has paid an ultimate price. You would think the descendants of Noah would get it right. No, they were losing their way almost immediately after getting off the ark. And it continued. It continued until there was no one left or not very many left on the planet who even believed that there was a way. But there was one man that God looked down from heaven and saw as a righteous man. It was a man who still understood that God had a solution, and that solution was the way. That man was Abraham. Check this out. Abraham is a symbol that mankind had lost their hope in the way. Abraham had to be called out from one of the most populous cities on the planet where he had lived all of his life, he had built a business, he had a large and extended family, and he was called out from that into the wilderness to be by himself because God was going to restart again from Abraham, one redemptive family. 
It was a profound reset. We get the Abrahamic covenant, which includes talk about the way. Again, let's go to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. It says, God talking to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse and in you. Here it is, talk of the way. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What was he saying in that last verse? He was saying this. He was saying the way maker is coming. The way maker is not only prophesied, he's, he, he's not only assured that he's coming, he's really coming now. Sir, did he come right away? 2,100 years later, there is another announcement that God made to a righteous man. His name was Joseph. Right? He said this, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Here it is. For he will save his people from their sins. Goes on. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. In church, what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. He w God would send his son to show us what? To show us the way back to God. That after losing our way in the days of Adam and losing our desire for the way in the days of Noah and even losing our hope that the way even existed anymore in the generation of Abraham, that in the generation of Joseph and Mary, they would hear the words, Emmanuel, God with us. God is going to show us the way back to himself. He's going to send his son who would solve the sin problem of the world. What an amazing fulfillment of that promise. Now fast forward just about 30 years. And Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. And he's trying to prepare them for something significant. He's preparing them for his death. And in John chapter 14, he begins by saying, look, I'm going to die and I'm going to go away, but where am I going to go? I'm going to go back to the Father. And I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's describing the way. I love those first two verses of John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Amen. And there's no mortgage attached. Bring it on. Jesus paid the mortgage already, right? Now, you would think the disciples would just be all about it. They'd have a praise and worship right, right on the spot. <laughs> and they didn't get it. They still didn't understand the way. This is how mankind is. We're just thick. We just don't get it. And so Thomas speaks first, <laughs> doubting Thomas. And what does he say? Check this out. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going Watch this. So how can we know the way? Wow. And then comes this most familiar statement of all of Jesus' statements, and yet the most unfamiliar part still to us is when Jesus said, Oh, but Thomas, I am the way. I am the way. Right? I am the way. When I die on a cross and I'm buried and I'm resurrected under my own power, 
And I go back to the Father, and I will prepare a place for you, and then I will come and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Thomas, I am the way. You just have to believe in me. Wow. Isn't that powerful? He's not just the way, right? He's the truth. <laughs> you know what? What the truth is here, the truth, there's truth about you that there's none righteous, not even one. Uh, the truth is that uh, all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. But the truth also includes this great gospel truth, which is that the free gift of God is eternal life to all those who believe. That's the truth. Right? That's the truth. We are all lost and broken. We have all lost our way. Because of Adam, but because of ourselves, we have lost our way. But God has shown us the way back through faith in Christ. And if we will but believe in Jesus, guess what? We can have life. We can have wonderful life. We can have abundant life. We can have eternal life because Jesus said, I am the life. Right? John 3.36 probably is the most succinct presentation of the gospel in all of Scripture. Let me read it to you. Jesus said, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Life and death are the choices before us this morning. What will you choose? Will you choose life, eternal life, abundant life, wonderful life? Or will you choose death to reject Christ and remain in your sins and remain on that lost path? Or will you choose Jesus who is the way back to the Father? You see, if you choose the way, that provides something we call eternal security. That once we believe in Jesus and we find the way, catch this, it means we will never lose our way again. Right? The way delivers us from the power of sin. Sin will no longer be your master. It delivers us from the guilt of sin. I no longer have to live a life of shame. It delivers us from the wrath of God and provides us the fullness of the joy of the Father. Wow. Jesus is the way maker. He's made a way back to the Father. Have you chosen to follow the way? Or are you like Thomas, saying we don't know where you're going and how can we know the way? He's made it so clear. He's given an invitation. He's put light on the path. Will you not follow the way? I want to pray for us to understand what we've received. And while I'm praying, Haley and Jake are going to come back up. And uh, they're going to offer us a, a season of response. And in that response time, I want you to think, I want you to think, have you ever personally chosen the way? Or are you still on your own path? Would you